Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the 34th physique meeting. Today is the, hang on a minute, let me just share screen and then I can show you my PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> right, right. Um, welcome to the 34th physic meeting. Today is the 17th of May, um, Wednesday, the second, the third Wednesday of the month, and we have started our meeting uh, earlier, but we have some problems with the speakers uh, turning up, and uh, even the fill-in speaker has got problems with the mobile phone, <laughs> so can't get in. But anyway, um, we are starting the meeting anyway, regardless, because we have um, our members here who can actually do the job in filling in the uh, speaker slot so as we all know physique is a platform for free energy special interest group enthusiasts to come in and to look for and explore truth and knowledge so we can march forward and get into um, a place where we can make a difference right so actually uh, the um, meeting is supposed to be welcoming Adrian Espinosa of Force versus Power on psychic reconnections and accessing AI database. He was used as a remote viewer in Monarch program and he was a, he's a sacred contract holder. Um, he's amazing. He's done a lot of good work for people and um, he was a former super soldier. Um, unfortunately, he, he had ran into some <laughs> some problems. Apparently, you know, I suppose listeners and viewers out there, you would understand that the work that we do here does have some risks and. <laughs> Uh, because this meeting is so important. <laughs> Sometimes we have very important speakers uh, who are stopped on their tracks and they can't join us because they don't want the information to come out to you, viewers, unfortunately. And we also lined up Cynthia Bolter to fill in for Adrian. Uh, unfortunately, she's got problems with her mobile phone connection and she can come in as well. Again, another block another well, well, attack on our <laughs> our march forward to help bring <laughs> some breakthroughs in what we are looking for to make this world a better world to live in and so um otherwise this meeting proves to be very very uh informative with what adrian has to bring about skynet and then we had etienne of course who's equally well versed about skynet and the AIs and scalar frequencies and all he on the free energy technology side of things. Unfortunately, even Etienne was booted off the internet. Gosh, this is really strange. Some things are trying to stop us from marching forward, as I say, in what we can do here. Whatever, you know, <laughs> we're not daunted. So we're going to carry on with this meeting, um, like it or not. You out there who are trying to stop us. We are going to continue with this. Okay, so we have here James, James Rink with us, who's co-chairing with me, and he's got a lot to offer. So um, um, we will then bring up the subject of um, what our speakers were talk, what is going to talk about, and we're going to cover quite a lot of things here in this meeting before we adjourn. And uh, when we finish, then we will adjourn it to the next meeting on the 7th of June. And hopefully we can get our speakers whom we have lined up for uh, the last couple of meetings to get back, like uh, Adrian or Cynthia. They can speak together in the next meeting on the 7th of June. And we will have a ball of a time. Right, for now, we have James with us. So over to you, James. I'm going to stop sharing now so you can then... Um, start introducing to uh, the listeners and viewers about what you know about Skynet and the secret space program agenda. Um, okay, well Skynet is a organization that connects to all the cyborgs and as well as uh, different types of um, com 
uh, computers within the military can actually they, they operate different like the battle some battleships and so on um, um, space weapons so um, as far and Skynet has been around for a very long time millions of years and it's actually a psychic database of connections so uh, AI technology there's nothing new even though you may think it's new because um, it, unless you're aware that um, there's extraterrestrials, then you wouldn't really understand why AI is new because it actually came from off world initial AI. Now, um, there's different factions um, that certainly run this planet. Some of the more um, savory ones are trying to hack into Skynet and take it over. And there's certain, there are timelines where that does happen. But right now, the uh, Skynet is run by a, a group of my opinion, uh, good people, um, and there is actual so software database interface that you can access Skynet. Now, I'm not sh quite sure how Adrian does it all. I mean, he explains it's, uh, um, it almost seems like it's a, an, an add-in plug-in to SRC for you or, or some type of software like that um, where you have to pay an extra fee and you, and you can interface with it. But um, well, unless Adrian's here explaining the details, I can't really tell you because um, I haven't actually seen it myself. Now, um, apparently, uh, Skynet has access to everybody's files, so you can uh, search for like um, extraterrestrial experiences, mill lab, or um, just asking uh, general questions. Now, one of the questions I was curious about was trying to talk to, um, I was trying to get a hold of the formula for the dragon pills, and we attempted to contact the goddess of immortality, and I couldn't even pronounce the name. I'll, I'll look it up while I'm talking, <laughs> so I can. The goddess of immortality, because um, I was wanted to see if we could get a hold of her. For um, this is a Chinese goddess, by the way. Um, if anybody, um, why is it, is it X I Wang Mu, Zai Wang Mu? Okay. Well, okay. Well, anyway, so um, we were trying to get in contact with her through Skynet, and she uh, apparently she was like, a, a, was it, I believe it was thirteenth dimension, and once you go above the seventh dimension, Skynet can no longer get in contact. So with the, these um, beings, so apparently there's a limit to who you talk to and, and the hierarchy of everything. But um, so wherever she is, I guess she didn't want to <laughs> interface with humanity, at least through, through AI. I don't, I guess I don't blame her, but um, or anyway, so, so then I had, um, I was meditating on it. So, okay, well I can't get the formula the dragon pills. So, so I was meditating on it and I wasn't really getting anything come through, but then I had this strange dream. I heard this name that says, I need to contact Madame Bambucha uh, to, to find out a formula for anti-aging um, or whatever, age reversal. So um, I did a regression with one of my friends, and we, we attempted to go through Astral to lo locate Bambucha because apparently she's still alive. So we didn't want someone who's like in the 17th dimension or whatnot. We want someone here in the physicality on this plane. So we found this lady, um, according to this regression, she was, I believe she lived somewhere in Southeast Europe because we saw field, lavender fields um, and it wasn't France. So it had, a, she was most likely Greek or Romanian. And um, we, we saw that uh, basically she was living in a very rural area and um, she herself was 175 years old. And um, apparently what she's been doing is taking blood orange seeds, crushing them up in like a mortar and pestle, I think it's called. Um, but apparently you can use a food processor, but she's, she does the old fashioned way. She's been crushing these seeds up um, and, and soaking them in olive oil with some rosemary. And rosemary is probably just there to cover the taste because if you've ever had gra grapefruit seed extract, you, you might be aware of how disgusting the, um, those um, citrus seeds are, um, but I've never had blood orange seeds. Now, apparently, 
blood oranges have been around. I think the first traces of a blood orange has been around since 1810. It's when it showed up in um, a portrait, um, a painting somewhere in, in um, Italy. So we know that, that blood oranges, even though it is a hybridization across something new, um, we, at least we know it's dated to that. So if you do the mathematics, I believe 175 is like 1847 or 42. I don't know how to do my mathematics on that. But um, so apparently uh, now, now, the, now the regression was only 30 minutes long and I, I had a lot more questions to, to explore. So I, I wouldn't be able to give you all the details. If, so if you start asking me, well, what about this and that? I, I couldn't tell you. But what I can say is that um, she um, – keeps it um i mean she doesn't really go around bragging how old she is she looks like she's about 80 years old um in very good sh shape for 175 so it appears that this if, if by crushing and i think you need to take one seed a day crush it up with some olive oil and um so it appears if you do that um a teaspoon of olive oil i think it is uh it will extend your life three times um and um, Vambucha wanted to share this with humanity because she is getting tired of living. She says she wants to return back to Jesus. Um, she's very religious, and um, and she was she's ready to move on. But um, I guess she got stopped <laughs> eating her seeds. But um, yeah, as far as the blood orange is concerned, it's basically it's a, it's a certain type of orange. I think it's the Sinensis cross. Of, of the regular orange and, and I couldn't really explain too much detail botanical on it but I, I am aware that uh, blood oranges get the color of the red color be, from um, something called uh, it starts with an A and um, I probably wouldn't be able to pronounce it but um, it's uh, in, uh, I'm just going to try to find Something starts with A. Well, anyway, um, what we were basically getting was that uh, the the red color is formed when the nights are cool, uh, like during winter time and spring. So these type of oranges can only be grown in really cool climates, um, like very uh, northern northernly climates, not tropical, because a lot of fruit, you know, like. You can't grow it and you can't get really good blood oranges from Florida. So um, maybe California, but um, typically you're going to have to get them during the, the winter time, um, November to May, I believe, um, unless you get from Chile um, or vice versa. <laughs> Three down south of the, of, not the um, equator. So, uh, yeah, um, we, we were picking up there is some kind of nutrient in the blood orange seeds that the DNA needs for its replication process, don't know what is, uh, made a hypothesis that perhaps blood oranges have been genetically hybridized with human DNA, and maybe that's one of the reasons why it's red, but um, apparently that's not true because, you know, red um, blood is hemoglobin, and um, so uh, I don't know. We'll have to get that tested and... Um, I don't really have a lot of, um, you know, money to do that, but uh, maybe somebody out there will want to explore, crush them up, and feed them to some guinea pigs for <laughs> see if it actually helps. Uh, I, don't, I, I suppose that's ethical. Okay, so um, that's basically all I have about that. Now, if anybody wants to throw any comments out there, uh, you, you can. I don't, I don't know if I'll be able to answer your question, but um, go for it. Thanks, James. Thanks for filling in like that. That is um, something <laughs> that would interest people, I guess. Uh, well, you know, James, you have a storehouse of information from your interviews that you did over the years from the uh, people who are coming together, the super soldiers, and you have a bag full of uh, stuff that probably you would like to disclose to the viewers on uh, what they're up to now with the secret space program. And we are especially very interested in the timing of when you think that the secret space program is going to 
to be gone, <laughs> to, to, to close shop. And, and when they do, uh, I suppose they have to let go of uh, the technologies that they have. I mean, um, are they going to have it open source and given to all for free? Or is it going to be secretly <laughs> followed through to some of their clothes? I, I mean, their, their, oh, what comes? I mean their, their buddies and their connect. Uh, well-connected uh, partners in the projects. Okay, that's a really long question. Could, could you be a little bit more specific? <laughs> okay. Well, right, um, right. Okay, because this is a free energy special interest group. Okay, now we, we, want, to be, um, we want to be relevant with what we're exploring here in this group. And we are especially interested, James, in in what the secret space programs up to with the technologies that they've got and uh, i suppose um, peter in one of the interviews that you had with him he says that uh, in another reality the secret space program is called a different name right and who well, does it belong to who owns it and when it's going to be shut down because the controllers are being changed now. There's a game change now. So uh, how how is the um, how are the technologies going to be possible? Well, yeah. Well, the other reality uh, is where the Nazis won World War II, and they disclosed everything. They released all the the, the exotic technologies, and in that reality, the secret space pro uh, program is called the Rom Fleet, and of course, uh, German is. Um, the, the spoken language um not only across the planet but in the galaxy too so uh yeah but um the the translation i believe that would be the same thing it's similar to the dark fleet but the dark fleet in our our reality is 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 actually very the, the things they do is dark so the, the in the other reality it's not they're not as negative but um essentially they do have exotic technologies that, that have been given to them through the Galactic Federation um, by treaty. I believe it was a 50-year treaty. I, I hope I don't get that wrong. Could have been, I don't think it was 70, but it was, it was most likely 50, that um, the, the Galactic Federation um, made ag agreements with the various groups of the SSP to uh, give them technology so that way they would – and by the way, 50 years would come to 1969. So um, they, uh, the, the treaties would have, um, the goal was for the SSP to release this technology back to humanity. But instead, what they've done is they've taken the technology and they've created their own little bre breakaway civilization. And then they've kidnapped people from planet Earth, brainwashed them, were, as they would tell them planet Earth has been destroyed, your family's dead. Um, oh, by the way, we re-aged you to a child, and here's your new German family to raise you on Mars. And they would be trained and groomed to be members of the Mars um, colony fleet, or um, there's different, you know, different SSP groups, the ICC, which is, um, stands for Interplanetary Corporate Conglomerate. That group is responsible for primarily gathering technologies, and um, it could be on Mars and different bases around, around the solar system. Um, there's the dark fleet, which is operates in deep space. Um, and then there's the Alliance, which is a uh, breakaway group, which apparently is just merged in the past year or two. But even they, um, I think, I, I don't, I don't know. I, mean, I think maybe the Alliance maybe have a better ch shot of helping people. Uh, I think they're probably helping us where as we're not being killed off anymore. Like they used to do that. Uh, that's probably why we're not seeing that. Um, but as far as any of these groups releasing technologies, a lot of them don't want to because, um, for instance, like the Dark Fleet, they have been kidnapping humans and erasing their memories, putting them, in, um, shooting them up with femto technology, and putting them into um, it comes with their the, their own stasis unit. They would sell these humans as slaves to other extraterrestrials where these humans would be responsible for maybe cleaning ships or I don't know, housekeeping or whatever the ETs would, would do sex slavery. 
So um, in exchange for that, the Dark Fleet's been getting technology. So they've been basically kidnapping people on Earth and, and um, delivering, tra trading us. And I mean, that is absolutely atrocious that they've gotten away with doing that. And um, I believe karma applies to everyone. And I, I, I don't even know why they, they think that they can get possibly get away with, I guess they have. Um, so I think a lot of, a lot of that's going to change. And it, in, a, in a way it's good because many of the people within the own dark fleet are brainwashed and programmed. So, um, right. So that's why in 2019, the Federation wants to get do away with any treaties. Actually, I, I've heard they are ready to do it by 2018. Uh, so, we will most we will probably see Andromedans walking down the streets or all these extraterrestrial groups because they are tired of what's taking place of um, our own government what um, what they've done because they, they uh, there are certain types of technologies I'm not sure if you call, familiar with the term love bite where you, um, somebody can take a certain device aim it towards you now I, I don't know what it's actually called. Um, I can I can possibly contact someone that that knows more about this, if if you want want to know, um, but uh, they can aim it at someone and manipulate your kundalini so that you would be attracted to this person or that person or they would become a new handler, and um, and they can basically turn off light workers. So so light workers have been coming to this planet to raise the consciousness, and here we have this technology that's that's totally shutting them down. And the Federation is extremely pissed off that this is taking yeah, place. Going against free will. <laughs> exactly. So um, things are going to get pretty wild in the next year or two. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't say it's going to happen 2018 or 2019. Maybe, maybe I don't know, think it'll be much longer after that. Mm -hmm. but, James, um, James, hang on a minute. Okay, let's backtrack a little. Okay, so you said that there's going to be a change over management. Right, so new management is going to take over the old management. So the dark fleet, the controllers are not going to be there to uh, do the uh, what do you call uh, controlling the uh, the puppets anymore. So therefore, therefore, who are the new management team and how? Yeah, well, are I, they never, I never said that. Yeah, the, 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 they're not going away. It's just that the Federation is not going to be making more agree, agreement to give them more technology. I don't know who, who the Federation is going to pick, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's certain groups of the Dragon family, because we'll probably start seeing some free energy devices out in the public sector available for sale. Um, and I'm not sure how they're going to do it. Maybe they'll have a, tel a replicator technology and just replicate them and say, here, you can buy them for whatever, 50 bucks, no big deal. Um, so we'll, I, I, I can't say for certain how it's going to happen, but um, uh, that certainly seems a lot more uh, plausible, I suppose, than um, waiting for the Dark Fleet or the ICC to, to say, oh, here, by the, oh, by the way, here, here we are in Mars. Oh, oh, we have free energy too. And we're going to give it to you for free. <laughs> so, if this um, secret space program is going to be done and over with by 2018, 2019, then um, what about all the technologies that they've been using for so long well, on us? Well, it's not going to be done away with. They're they're still going to be running their bases, and they're still going to be in outer space. I mean, they probably are not going to be allowed to abduct humans anymore. And there'll probably be a day of reckoning, um, but uh, you know they're off world. So what what are we going to do? Their technology is so much more advanced, unless the Federation helps us. But that's why I think a lot of people are going to have to learn forgiveness. And I think that's probably going to be the, the hardest part of this transition once people realize that. Oh, by the way, we've all been mind. Um, I can't really say. That. Can, I, can I curse? <laughs> uh, to the point where we get yeah everything. A whole a whole reality is going to be basically coming crashing down. A lot of people are not going to be able to handle it, um, and so they're they're concerned about that. You know, already what's well, going to happen when people start losing it? Yeah, but, but well, why why the secrecy? Secrecy is only when people are covert about their activities, their programs. Right? Well, they want to well, to come out. The, yeah, well, the ETs they wanted humanity to figure things out on their own. Uh, they were hoping through free will we would 
um, be able to ascend and, and f transcend your own problems without intervention. But um, unfortunately, um, there's too much things going against us that that's probably never going to happen. And we're, life is just going to keep going on and on and on for another thousand years. We'll still be paying for electricity. And next thing you know, we'll have giant skyscrapers in the sky where food is cloned and everybody's uh, total brainwashed and controlled. So we don't want, we don't want that, that parallel reality. We want one where there's lots of positive things happening. We're, we're be like Star Trek. <laughs> Well, the majority of the masses are waking up to the fact that everything that is on this planet, the whole system, the, the whole um, structure and the hierarchy of, of, of the control system on this planet is very unjust and very unfair because there's such a huge big divide between those, the few percentage of the, um, the wealthy and the well the privilege and the underprivileged. So therefore, now that people are awaking, uh, awakening towards this injustice, um, they are they are clamoring for the uh, transparency of um, things that are going on that has been kept secret from them. So there has been uh, researchers done. I mean, there has been research done by journalists like uh, Linda Moulton Howe, for instance, and she's always substantiating her research with, with proof, with dates, with data, with uh, historical facts and um, whatever statistics that she could get hold of. And that is, that is very good. And I can see that, James, you're doing something like that as well. You always substantiate your interviews in your Super Soldier Talk uh, shows with uh, pictures with lots and lots of the um, uh, diagrams and pictures and just to substantiate what you're saying is a reality of sorts. So why is it that people are not allowed to know and they, I, I hear from the interviews that um, Linda has done uh, that there, there were discussions even amongst the controllers whether or not to let the majority of humanity know about the secret space program and what it has been doing. Mm. So why you said it's a few short years. Yeah. Right? Well, well, the information I gave you is uh, through a source. I, I, I can't even tell you much more th than that, but um, what, uh, if you, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, what I'm showing here are the different groups according to Corey Good. Um, I think this is Michael Sala. I'm not sure who person this, but um, uh, Solar Warden is another organization. Um, and this group is, uh, and these are all different parts of the SSP, different factions. So I didn't mention this one, but Solar Warden is responsible for R&D uh, tech for um, keeping track of intruders and visitors. Um, of course, I already mentioned the ICC. They, they barter trade for technology, and the Dark Fleet is out in deep space. Um, they work with the Draco. And then there's the NATO-type groups, uh, like, for instance, the um, – I guess that would, that would probably be the new alliance, the new um, secret space program alliance going on. But there's different groups that are associated with NATO countries. And then there's the various SSP programs, secret um, – that would be – military contractors like that used for super soldiers um, and that's where where I was part of and there's many many of those um, but they're all they all have like their own agenda so what I would encourage you to do is go read this article and I'm gonna post a link if you just so you can read more about the secret space program and um, let me figure out how to do this oh gosh Okay. I don't know my, uh, okay, there, it's gone. All right. So yeah, go check that link out um, to learn more about the secret space program. Now, um, I don't remember what your question was. Um, Crystal, if you want to repeat it. Otherwise, no, I'll... No, I, I was saying, why the secrecy? Why not? disclose it all now because they only have a few short years now 
since um, time's gonna come up soon right um i believe um whether or not let me i should put my camera okay so uh, as far as your question um i don't know how how much you would con consider cobra um a credible source i do follow follow him and and he claims there are these um plasma toplet bombs um that apparently it's almost like um the the i'm gonna say the cabal but the dark alliance the dark i'm not dark the dark groups they are uh strange lit bombs plasma strange lit bombs not top well actually there are top lit bombs um, I couldn't even really explain the difference. So <laughs> is, the two is it kind of like the plasma that uh, we were taught to do? In uh, the, uh, no, in the, uh, no. Apparently, if one of these bombs explode, it's it's similar to like a wormhole opening up, and it just destroys, it sucks everything away. Um, oh. There, and it can even suck up the whole universe if it's not stopped. But um, the Federation has technology to stop them. So basically what they're doing is they're threatening to destroy the whole planet saying, well, you know, if you show yourselves and you, you intervene, um, then we will detonate all these, this exotic weaponry and planet earth will not only planet earth, the whole solar, uh, this whole quadrant and the system will, will cease to exist. So essentially, um, they're holding everybody hostage and they're trying to clean all that up. So that's the one of the reasons why they haven't just come in and do it right now. If that, if that makes any sense. Oh, right. Oh, does anyone have any question on this direction for James on the um, SSP program technologies? Press, you got something? Something coming in. It's like, well, okay. Uh, put my camera on here. There we go. Uh, so the Skynet, it, a lot of us. Uh, have friends that are psychically inclined. Are they tapping into the Skynet directly, or is it uh, other beings? Is there in this telepathic portion interface? Is that how it works? Well, you have to be AI. I mean, part cyborg yourself, meaning that um, uh, you would need to either maybe in a past life you would have had been a cyborg and somehow they you would have been shot up with some kind of ai technology some kind of goo black not necessarily black goo but there's different types of goo ai goo um that before you could start interfacing with it so if you were just a psychic and and you weren't in, um infected with any of this stuff or shot up what well, was i would necessarily call it an infection and <laughs> it was negative but um, yeah, you probably wouldn't be able to interface. Um, but, uh, but I believe they have satellite monitoring technology and can probably listen to in pr pretty much everyone's thoughts and communication processes on the planet. But for you to interface would require yeah. more of, um, an AI component to your DNA. Does that, does that make sense? Wow. Yeah, I was, because some of, you know, we've taken a look at some of the folks that have had implants put in. Uh, you know, it's, most of like it's like ear tags. You know, it's, it's a one-way communication. We, <laughs> from yeah. what I understand. Okay, for yeah. as far okay as far as the implants are concerned, um, ETs don't really need to use implants. Uh, their technology is so advanced that um, it makes the cabal look like child's play. Even though the cabal has been training and, and stealing tech from them. Um, the uh, the most advanced um, maybe different SSP groups, uh, for instance, like groups associated with DARPA or even the, some levels within the Illuminati, are uh, use duck people and shoot them up with an implant per se. So I would say if if you have a like a lump or some kind of something put inside of you, that's most likely one of these um, SSP groups. But the extraterrestrials, they, they have femto technology and extremely advanced tech where they would not even need anything. So, yeah. Could you have those lumps surgically removed? <laughs> uh, you could. I know someone said that um, when they tried doing that, I believe it was Dr. Lear, Ro mm -hmm. Robert Lear. Um, mm -hmm. he, he says that when he was conducting surgery, the implants would move as he was cutting into the flesh. 
this, oh. the implants would try to get away. Mm -hmm. And then um, what would happen is if you're not, if you don't really go in there, I mean, even if the, it, the, the patient is under sedation, the, the patient will wake up from the pain. Um, apparently there's not enough sedation to keep them sedated. And then the implant could break off and become septic. And that is an issue as well. So as far as removal is concerned, I think it's probably best that you ask certain benevolent extraterrestrial groups to take you aboard the ship and let them do it professionally. But um, I suppose you could have it done here on planet Earth. Unfortunately, Dr. Lear is now deceased. Yeah. I don't know anybody else that is publicly attempting to remove implants um, unless you want to comment about that or anyone else. Well, I, I remember seeing when we had this interview with uh, Betty Brassard, she was showing some pictures of uh, Dr. Lear and, uh, well, he was uh, all cut up in blue and black on the operating table or something like that and he was dead. I mean, it was gory, <laughs> if, if I'm not mistaken, that was him. Anyway, um, you were right, James. I remember Penny Bradley was talking about how, um, a, uh, how they were being implanted with the uh, DNA streams from the ET so that they could actually uh, pilot the fleet, the dark fleet that she was piloting to transport cyborgs and all that. I could remember that, that she was saying that. Otherwise, you won't be able to pilot the, uh, the, uh, the spacecrafts. You must have the ET genes, some, some sort of an ET genes to do that, to be able to communicate right. with the crafts, yeah. Right, um, certainly. I know it's, within the Montauk project, only people with certain types of metagene factor would even be able to activate the chair and I, I think it has a lot to do with your creativity and your your ability to become psychosomatic to dissociate um, the more likely you are to have all the higher IQ higher uh, more alters um, more ability to split mm -hmm. your mind um, is a sign of your ability to go into hyperspace so it's a zero point uh, where you're out of so you're out of space time and you can travel and then open up these portals so they're looking for people that can do that kind of stuff in the um, the consciousness chair that they they stole from a crashed uh, UFO is where so, they got. So, in other words, people there. with RH uh, negative <laughs> could um, be good contenders for <laughs> for using. Well, certainly, I believe that 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 factor of genetics is. Um, goes back to the time of Atlantis and some certainly there would there could be a case for that um, but I know it's that's not always the case because certain extraterrestrial groups are abducting blood bloodline families and they can basically take anybody and manipulate the children the offspring next thing you know they, they do they have these factors well I don't so. quite understand what what they meant by you know having to implant these genes more of it or a specific gene pool to be in the in the in the system in order to operate their technologies but we were told that we are the pathos anyway uh, that we have, we carry the 22 root races of the, uh, the ET in our, uh, well, genetic makeup. So, so, I mean, what's the big deal? <laughs> we already have ET genes anyway. We are the ETs as well anyway. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what's the question? So the question is, what, what's, the, what's the big deal? I mean, why is it that we, they have to inject more of this, or implant more of this, um, um, the, the ET's um, hybridization stuffs into the people who are to operate the machines? Well, I believe what was taking place during the time of Atlantis is they were genetically engineering a slave race of humans that would be more easily controlled and then after the cataclysms, the slave race uh, started to reproduce a lot more so than the original bloodline families. So now we, what we've got is um, a, a, a great, I, don't, I couldn't tell you the percentage of humanity, but it does appear pretty, pretty large that is now low consciousness because their DNA has been shut down. So they're trying to get that to turn on so they can have more of their, their clairvoyant abilities, more of their intuition. And um, 
unfortunately, um, to do that, I guess it would require some upgrades um, tinkering with the DNA code. But um, a, a lot of these souls that are entering these bodies have already—they they already know that took place before they entered into the body. So you could say, well, maybe they, their free will choice agreed to it. But um, I know that's not always the case, especially if a child is grown in an underground laboratory or or area whatever whatever area it could be um, off world too on Mars and so on. So, and they certainly do experiments like that. And I think that's got, that's got to come to an end for sure. Well, I've seen, I've seen Linda Moulton house, house uh, lectures. She has got um, some uh, uh, drawings and illustrations to substantiate her, her, well, her disclosure of what, uh, she presented in her talks, like for instance, the gray species, some of the species, the gray species, they could actually have such a very advanced technology whereby they could use um, some, uh, well, you know, technology contraptions that could harvest people's human souls and, uh, and uh, transfer the soul from a damaged body into a clone body. I suppose you know about that. And then the soul will come out from the damaged body and it's it's like it's like a, a well, you know, like like an oval with the sharp points on the top and the bottom, like an oval shape, and then it, it comes out like like a, a, a flash of light and um, and like an not quite an ectoplasm. It's bright and it's 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 very bright. It's it's radiantly beautiful and it comes out the soul and then it just goes into the clone body that is in a capsule. And that person then carries the personality, everything that the soul carries from the original body that is damaged into the clone body, the consciousness so, and the. So what you're uh, seeing here is it, and the memory and everything. Yeah. So what you're seeing here is um, a drawing um, sent to me um, from someone who claims he's seen one of these chairs on one of the gray ship. Uh, so this is a, a soul transference chair. Um, and this is made out of some kind of crystal material. It's transparent and pinkish. Um, so when you sit in this, um, you become transparent. And then um, you have uh, so your soul. So I guess then they, they can put a new soul into your body. Um, there are no straps or anything. And then there's a gun to harm a soul made out of same transparent crystal. Okay, so fortunately I couldn't really tell you much more about that except that that, that is that is great technology. And um, I'm, I'm fairly confident the uh, different secret space groups, program groups have access to that. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't believe that um, they can really touch you when you're on the other side. They can maybe try to contain your frequent, your soul energy, but I don't think they can go in there and try to torture you while you're in heaven or something like that. But that is but, so wrong to put a soul to mess up this whole human evolutionary process with the uh, progression of ascension and all that. It's so wrong to mess up this this whole system of the, the cycle. Well, well, I, unfortunately, I mean, I, I would agree with you. Uh, the, the thing is, is that uh, um, the way they see it is that, oh, well, you made an agreement. You, you, a long, long time ago, you chose to incarnate in planet Earth, and that gives, you, gives us the right to, to do as we please. But I, I think that's got to come to an end, too, because it's, that's atrocious that that's even allowed to take place. But um, yeah, apparently they, they can contain your soul energy. Um, so if, you're, if your body was killed in combat, they could clone a new one. It takes, I guess, 24 hours, maybe two hours, depending on Gosh. who you talk to. It's such a serious violation of the universal law again here. Yeah. Right. Well, it's, um, it's not natural anymore. I, I believe you can you can still bring a soul back to a body that's been deceased. So I think in that regards, I think it's good. But um, for say, take uh, DNA from King Tut 
and genetically engineering, I mean, um, genetic, um, gr growing it into a clone in a lab, and then you're giving yourself uh, Obama, so um, Obama, but um, I don't think the same soul is in that body. Um, but certainly, um, there's a lot of possibilities, and there is ways of going back and finding those original souls, uh, Genghis Khan or whoever else you want to reanimate from the dead and bring them back. But um, there should be some universal laws against it, and I, I'm not quite sure how that how that's that, that's that's not a really question I can answer. I'm, I'm going to jump in on with a question that's related to this, and this is in my field of expertise. Uh, when we talk about hybrids, uh, basically you're doing from your high school uh, biology class, you've heard of what's called a Mendelian cross, maybe in first year of university. And what happens is you have two individuals and you breed them and you end up with a combination of the genetics. Now, if you take the children or the offspring of that and you mate them, you end up with a, a lot of the originals back, they uncross. When you make and cross from di different bloodlines together, certain uh, dominant or recessive traits get expressed in the next generation. So most of the time when they're doing hybrids, they're looking for dominant traits so that that's the easiest one to predict is that if the dominant trait for, let's say, hair color is black and you mate them with somebody that has red hair like mine, most of the offspring would be coming out with black hair, but they would carry the recessive gene for the red hair. Uh, at a later date, when the dominant gene, which doesn't get expressed or doesn't show up in the mixture, then the, the recessive gene, genes come back and you start seeing back in your population, the red hair, the blonde hair, in groups of people that normally wouldn't have that. And what we may be looking at where we have so many people on the planet with more mobility and uh, interracial uh, marriages and offspring, we may be starting to see some of these other traits reappear that haven't been expressed on the planet since, you know, the time of Atlantis. And I was seeing if you, what your thoughts were on that line that maybe what we're looking at in the Ascension is that we've got in our star children, some that have received more of the star children seed and uh, are being expressed and from line, lineage that we wouldn't anticipate it from, coming from. Okay, well, like, I, James? okay, I can try to answer as best I can. So um, from my um, research, it appears that DNA is holographic and as a hologram, it contains all the fragments of the whole um, so basically, um, you can take um, human DNA and all the codons for all the other types of DNA are already in for insects or whatnot. So all of us are really, it's just that certain codons are being expressed. And so what's going on is the ETs can take femtonites and... Um, and I'm going to explain this right, and, and they can actually activate the codon. So this is how, how they do this. Um, so again, femtonites uh, manipulate nuclear energies um, around the atoms, as well as manipulating quarks. So um, typically, like nano, nanites would just manipulate the codons. Femto actually alters the quarks within the atoms itself. Now, quarks um, is an uh, elementary particle that um, uh, is a fundamental constant of matter, so I'm, I'm just reading some here, quarks combine to form composite particles called hardons, hadrons, I'm going to say, <laughs> so sorry, that's hard. could be that too, the most stable of which are protons and neutrons, the components of atomic nuclei. For femtites, you need quarks form from, um, from the atoms to make whatever atom you want, and then you can alter DNA structures in a human body on the molecular level as well as subatomic level, blocking the natural cycle of psychic abilities when a growing within a growing human being. And this can also damage basic growth cycles. So some of these femtonites can be uh, cause for harm, but um, essentially um, nano is one to the ninth power of size, 
size small femtos one to the 15th. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they can, um, they can certainly go in there and alter and express whatever DNA they want, uh, or even on a quantum level affect the, um, air parts, the DNA that science is, does, is not even aware of yet. So there's, there's a lot going on here that, um, it's, it's, it's really, it's kind of hard to even explain it unless we really understand the science behind it. And it's still a new field. Uh, but, uh, yeah, ho hopefully that answered your question. Mm -hmm. I just will turn you loose on that one. You did a great job. Thanks. Thanks, James. You're very good. Man. Hey, uh, what about you, <laughs> Daniel? Daniel, you've got something to say. Daniel, you've been doing a lot of research yourself and been reading up. <laughs> you came with a lot of questions, I know, and uh, because our speakers are not able to make it. James is, well, you know, he's, he's a powerhouse of knowledge here. Probably you could do some... Uh, um, well, you know, some conversation with James on that direction as well. Daniel? Daniel? We can't hear you. Are you speaking up? Can anybody hear Daniel? No. Okay, he says his internet is not good okay so um daniel we speak up whenever whenever your internet is allowing you to okay right would you like would you like me to talk about some of my humanitarian projects sure in a minute hang on a minute i see peter here our host peter Hello, hello, Crystal. Hello. hello, hi. You've been there in the background quietly. It's been a long time we haven't seen you. It's so good to have you. Yes, I, I would like to not go off the topic because James did explain quite a, you know, quite a bit of a knowledge. I want to only add to that knowledge that our scientists from, from our Earth, they already find out how to, how to save the data in the DNA. Whoa. And that turns you can, you can out. Can we see you? Can we see you? We've been. No, missing. unfortunately, on this computer, the the camera is just driver is faulty or the camera itself is faulty and mm -hmm. microphone only is working. So unfortunately, no. I would have to go to the laptop to switch. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just want to explain. Okay, now Peter Fickner is our host, our Zoom host for physique. Okay, and you I've been are, using you his are. Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I've been using his Zoom for physique meetings. So just in case some of you are confused, why there are two P Peter thickness here <laughs> thank you i can i can change the name every no, no, don't, don't change it's fine i'm happy using your name go okay. ahead carry on okay so so what i want to say only that scientists you can google it and it's a open knowledge uh, scientists already know how to use a dna yes to save the data and record the data and read the data from it and it's far more uh, have far more capabilities than the regular data resources we're using at the moment. It's only the cost, for now, only the cost, it's too high, but the capacity is significantly higher than, than we're using today. So DNA will be probably the next step of hard drives we're using in the computers nowadays, yes? So that, that will be probably the, the number one. And plus the second part, what people are not aware of, we, our DNA, our human DNA, that's it as well something to add to the knowledge about the DNA, is that we've got only 10% of DNA is ours. Only, every human being has only 10% of its own DNA. 90% of its own DNA not belong to you as a human being, but belong to the microorganisms living within you, like bacteria and so on. So we might think that we inherit something from the parents, but for real, we did inherit just a bit from parents, but the most from the environment we live in and the bacteria and the microorganisms are, who are, which are within us, yes? So when you understand it, when you really go through the knowledge, how you and what's quiet, Daniel. Oh no, Crystal, you have to do it. I can't. Yeah, I, I, I'm, mute. I'm, 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 I'm mute. just muting, muting, mute. And, yes. So and welcome to Otherworld Global TV.
uh, when when you are aware of that knowledge then you start to um, let's say learn more about it and if you learn more about it you start to be more aware and you really start to go more healthy because you know that that bacteria will have a bad influence on you yes and your dna will be twisted really twisted so so it's it's really great interesting topic and proven by science it's it's you can really google it and both of these things you know about dna you can really google right now and and you can really learn and you can have a benefit out of it yes yeah? so that's only what i was trying to add to the knowledge hopefully you know it will be quite interesting for you too oh. Thank you so much for adding to the equation there, Peter. No like, because you know we are we are on track. We are relevant with all these discussions because without a better knowledge and deep knowledge of the makeup of a DNA, we can't really move forward anyway. Because we were talking on the on the uh, subject of how the ETs were manipulating our DNA and uh, and uh, implanting us as well, so we could then use their machines and their equipment and their technologies, right? So if we don't understand deeper and deeper of how the makeup the inner dna is how are we going to then come up with this uh, this free I energy would, devices to use uh, properly I, I would say that we can uh, we can go with it i would say let's learn oob out of body experience and you've got all knowledge available for free and everything even foreign languages you can learn there no problem like my friends do uh, you can you can travel. You can learn about ancient technologies, about future technologies over there. No problem. OOB, out of body experience, or talk with people who had and uh, near death experiences. Yes, who are dying. They know some of this stuff as well. So I, I would recommend. You know, if you really want to seek for it. I would go for something which is certain, and certain is knowledge about afterlife. Yes, so on the energy level, life. Mm -hmm. uh, species who are not uh, with bodies like we, but you know, species who are just energy made Either, out of where energy. Where are you now? Are you in Poland? Or it, you no, in Scotland, okay. at home. In Scotland. All oh, right, welcome. I home. was. I just came. Yeah, I just came mm -hmm. back from Poland. It was a really uh, long holiday. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah. OOB, that would be my answer, you know, if you really want to search for the answer, I would say OOB, out of body experience, would be the best place to look for. Mm -hmm. At least I know of the people who was trying to get answers for different topics, they couldn't, especially about aliens, mm -hmm. and all of their answers came from over there. Mm -hmm. Hey, Peter, so now that you're home in Scotland, we I trust that you will attend uh, the meetings more often. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm, I'm trying. You see, I just, you know, I just knew about this meeting, so that's why I came as soon as Wonderful. possible. Yes, uh, James is doing a great job, you know. It's mm. unfortunate that um, I heard our, our important speakers were blocked from coming in. But it's okay, yeah. we will have them back next week. Uh, I mean, next meeting, so mm. in the next few weeks, yeah. So, hi, Daniel, you want to say something, Daniel? Daniel, I think his team. internet is still not okay. Daniel, Daniel, take your questions out. Yeah, he has a lot to say, but uh, unfortunately, his phone's not working well. <laughs> Daniel, maybe you can type. Just type, you know, the questions, and then someone will try to Actually, answer. Actually, he has typed some questions for me to ask Adrian, but I guess it's not appropriate because Adrian's not here. You know. Uh, uh, Daniel, can I have your permission to read some of your questions? I guess we can repeat this um, again when Adrian's here. Yeah, since you can't speak, he says he wants to sp talk about chemtrails and geoengineering. Sulfur dioxide is produced when fuels that contain sulfur compounds burn. It is a gas with a sharp choking smell. He says when sulfur dioxide dissolves in water droplets in clouds, it makes the rain more acidic than normal. This is called acid rain. The Great Smoke of London. Okay. Uh, 4,000 people died in 1952. Uh, well, yeah, a lot, thousands were being, hundreds of thousands being hospitalized, thousands of animals in the area were also killed. Air pollution causes 40,000 early deaths a year in the UK, he says. Right, so he says, question is, in this moment, 
army, the army sprayed sulfur particle, particles in the stratosphere to reflect solar radiation. What effect have this procedure to human life from a hub is is it possible to use to heat atmosphere and to activate chemical reaction? Well, these are really <laughs> scientific <laughs> technical questions. I suppose we can't answer these questions unless the, uh, well, I guess our fresh frazzle may attempt to do so. <laughs> okay, over to you. And if uh, you have more questions. It's an interesting. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting thing. We've been watching actually with the uh, dam at Oroville, California, the Oroville Dam. Uh, there's been quite a bit of weather modification that you can actually watch. There's been dozens of us been around the world have been watching air uh, cloud patterns as they come into California and then be diverted north into Northern California and Southern Oregon. Uh, we've seen uh, transmission stations all over the United States and it's made it really easy to identify the military bases where these radar systems or harp systems uh, have been in place. I mean, it's like they're all lit up and it's easily seen from satellite imagery. And then you go in with your Google uh, Earth, your Google satellite uh, maps and zero in on it. And I highly recommend people to, when they see an anomaly on the weather radar maps to actually go find it because this is your government, the United States government in this case, uh, possibly other countries around the world, basically doing weather modification. And under international law, they are not supposed to modify other nations' weather. They're only supposed to modify their own. But the thing is, is what you modify here has an effect downstream. So you are, in fact, when you manipulate your own weather, manipulating the weather of others. So when you set up uh, the chemtrails, you're setting up aluminum, barium, uh, and other minerals in the upper atmosphere, and it forms this opacity. This, it's kind of a white screen. And part of it reflects solar radiation, so we're not getting the radiation that you need, you know, say B vitamin, that kind of stuff, it's a form of radiation. Uh, you're not getting uh, vitamin D in the levels that you should have when you expose your skin to the sunlight if the sky is being obscured. The other thing that happens is with light pollution, on one side, we're not seeing the stars. Let's say if you're in Los Angeles, you very rarely see the star stars at night. But when you have a high layer, layer of clouds, a cirrus layer up even higher, you block out more of these stars. So you lose the connection that you had with the universe here on the planet because your sky is obscured. So yeah, there's, these effects are happening. Uh, with all that stuff in the atmosphere, it does rain down. And this will be picked up by your plant material, your trees, your grasses, and things like that. And uh, until that vegetative matter breaks down into its base elements and is taken back to the ocean, uh, it's bound there. Uh, what are the consequences? Uh, maybe not as healthy a trees in your forest. You may end up with more debris that is basically decaying. You may end up with, if you don't have a bug infestation because the metals are too high, you end up with a fire situation. So you end up, uh, if you have a drought after you have a, a series of sprays, you may end up with trees that are, that are more susceptible to drought and they die, which are leaving you to forest fires, which would increase the amount of particulate matter in the atmosphere. And when we get back to the situation where, similar to what would happen when during the, uh, in Europe, when they were burning a lot of coal or the East Coast of the United States during the iron, uh, where they're smelting iron and using a lot of coal to convert for electricity and for materials, uh, this causes another way of obscuring the sky. It's a part of a process. Uh, we can stop it. You know, it'll take a while after it stops because we have to basically break down the vegetable matter that's got the aluminum and the barium bound up into it. But that allows it for the rebirth of new grasses, new trees, and your, your pristine forest once again. But yeah, does it have effect? Yeah, it has effect. And we need to stress with our governments and stuff that the Clean Air Act is for the health of everybody. It's, 
it's not just, uh, you know, we have one industry that says you can't burn coal, but yet we, we take our military when we fly aluminum and barium in the upper atmosphere. This is still affecting our air quality and the quality of life of those on the planet. And that goes from humans clear down to the bacterial level you're affecting. It's, uh, so, yeah, it has an effect. Else? <laughs> well said. Um, the only thing I the only thing I could add about chemtrails is um, it's being done by Monarch Solutions, and um, they have planes that can teleport, and inside the planes teleport the uh, chemicals they sp uh, spray on us. Um, and there's very little that our government or milit military can do. They can't even shoot them out of the sky because they teleport. Uh, so I know a lot of people are furious and angry at their politicians for chemtrailing them. And I try to tell these individuals that our politicians and our, even our own governments are not responsible for any of this. And they just don't really want to, uh, don't get it. So there's a lot of people are angry out there. So I think it's important to get the facts um, before making a judgment. But um, as far as I, I did talk a little bit about the, um, the, um, the Orville Dam. Um, apparently, there was a uh, in San Bernardino. Underneath San Bernardino, there's an underground dump there where the cabal had got a hold of a mothership, and I believe the mothership was like two miles long. And they attempted to turn the hard drive. I'm sorry, um, the um, the drive on the space the um, to to turn the ship on. And uh, there's a certain process they have to go through. And they just bypassed the the, pro, the correct procedure to turn it on, and it causes the destabilization within the San Andreas Fault. And that fault line expressed itself, the, the energy expressed itself over near Orville Dam as an explosion, and an implosion rather, that imploded underneath the dam that caused the ground to shift. And so that's the reason why that's actually what caused the uh, Orville Dam to collapse. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they, they're probably doing geoengineering too. Uh, these different groups all work with each other. They're like, well, you know, if we screw up the dam, it's all better for us because we can have martial law and we can have ways to choose to have more control over people. So I don't think they really cared either way what the outcome it's not like they were purpose purposely targeting the dam they probably knew it was going to happen but they just didn't care and um yeah so um that's what my sources claim took place uh so i know that's definitely a little bit outside the box but that's what apparently is what i've been told anyway take what you want <laughs> yeah, so there's I, been a bunch if, of us if i may, if I may just uh, refer everyone to James um, interview with Peter and uh, and Dan Mac what's his full name again James go to super soldier talk com YouTube channel You're, and you yeah. find the details on the Oroville Dam meta mm -hmm. Peter James yeah Peter the insider give Peter us an update then. on that yeah mm -hmm. right yeah well, the, we uh, what's really interesting with the weather modification around California during the Oroville Dam uh, disaster in the works that was there is how much there was work by it looks like our government to steer water away from that over full dam so in many ways we, having the technology probably saved millions of lives in moving those jet streams north and south away from the watershed of the Oroville dam so uh, it, as I said they actually uncloaked big time this time I've never seen so many uh, modifica weather modification stations up and running mm -hmm. at full tilt as I have in the last two months. And mm -hmm. uh, it's like, yeah, it causes problems in the Midwest because that's where they had a uh, tornado spinning and, and heavy rainstorms, but they managed to keep the water from catastrophically overfilling the Oroville Dam. It was absolutely primed prior to it for a disaster and it's been averted and I'm really pleased to see the courageous work it was in weather modification from the Alaskan stations clear down into the Southern California stations to the ones in Texas, the ones in Louisiana, across uh, Florida, up into Georgia and stuff. They were all lit up and all working in harmony to 
keep the the excess rain from hitting any more on the Oroville Dam. So anyway, mm -hmm. kudos to them on well, that one. Uh, uh, Press, there are more yes. questions from Daniel for you. Okay. okay. Uh, technical or scientific questions, chemical questions from Daniel. Since he can't speak up, I have to speak on his behalf. Uh, it's a good job. He emailed me these questions prior to our meeting. He says, what possible solution are available to clean the atmosphere. Um, can I read all the questions first and then you can tackle them on my okay. own? Okay, I'll, what I'll chemical, get that, okay. What chemical component will uh, activate a, um, a what? Uh, hang on a minute, I can't read that. A reaction to transform all chemicals in excess from the atmosphere in good, or, or in good chemicals for earth and for life from uh, can you make up what Daniel is saying? His English is not too good. Well, anyway, and then he says, Yes, we can. To spray in the atmosphere ammonium, benzene, or something else to trigger, I'm uh, just sorry, to, whoa, well, uh, to trigger this reaction is beneficial for Earth. Yeah, okay. And to what areas yes. Earth is possible? To manage this ammonia desert Alaska oceans, okay. And what type of condition need to well oh, to allow uh, uh, to happen a, an ocean a clean process? Yeah, sorry, a clean process. <laughs> Temperature, attitude, type of frequency, scalar waves, scalar waves, he asked. So can you make uh, sense out of what he's asking? I'm just Okay, let's start with question here. number one. Mm -hmm. The atmosphere is cleaned up with the universal solvent, and we happen to have lots of it, and it's just a matter of time, and that's called water, H2O. Uh, you don't have to add anything else to the atmosphere. You just, it, it basically scrubs it out. You have other chemical reactions going on up there in the presence of water, everything from um, sulfuric acids and some of these other interim uh, reactions. They happen naturally. Uh, it just takes time for it to all precipitate in the form of rain back to the surface. So yes, it is possible. The, uh, the great uh, philosopher, I call him George Carlin, says, the, save the earth, ha. Huh. The earth is like a dog with fleas and it'll shake humanity off as if it was a dog with fleas. So earth will take care of itself. It's a matter of if we can still hang on. Mm -hmm. um, the adding other chemicals to the atmosphere to counteract the chemicals that are already up there is basically adding more toxins to the soup. You're not cleaning the stuff, you're, you're making the soup worse. So no, we don't really want to add more chemicals up there. We want to just let the water go up Precipitate it down. He was saying wash it up. To, to add what chemical component as a catalyst that will activate yeah. a reaction. Water is your universal solvent, and uh, it basically will collect it in droplets. It has a, an attractive force to it. Uh, we're saying it's uh, the gravitational force of the molecules. It pulls it in, forms the droplets. The droplets bring down in either hail, snow, or water droplets and makes its way to the uh, oceans. The oceans have a process that they basically, through evaporation, it's like distillation, puts the clean water back up in the, in the air and does the, the process over. Uh, Victor Schauberger talks about the cycle being in two stages, where one, the evaporation of water comes from the ocean, goes up in the air, rains down on the, the rivers, and then is picked up by the trees, that through transpiration, the water droplets go back into the atmosphere, pure it again with a different energetic signature to it, to the top of the mountains, and then it makes its way down through the valleys and stuff and out to the ocean. So Schauberger says it's in two stages. Most science says it's in one, but I think Schauberger is just a little bit closer in detail how it works. Um, there was the third question. I think he was talking about the methane yeah, to Under spray the, in the atmosphere ammonium, benzene, or something else to trigger this reaction is beneficial for Earth? Mm, That's the third. I, as I said, 
I'm really not looking to, to add anything more to the atmosphere to try to do a reaction in air, whereas the water, it's like putting up, if you have a lot of dust in the in a room, you put up a, a spray curtain of, of mist and it keeps it from, it, it brings it back down to the floor and you can clean it out easier rather than try to do it through paper filters and something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, what I was wondering what he was talking about was the fear of the uh, trapped methane that's underneath the ice and stuff. Uh, as some of these glaciers or uh, ice packs melt, this takes the pressure that's holding the methane, the hydrogen sulfides and that type of stuff, and you could have these many eruptions. And some of that's happening right now in Russia, where the, all of a sudden there's a hole in the ground, it looks like a sinkhole, but it looks more expelled than going down. And it's, uh, they figure there's probably a methane gas bubble that let loose and pushed everything out and caused these holes up there. Those, yeah, they're not too nice for anything living around it because you, you basically have a case for suffocation. Uh, uh, it's also flammable. Uh, fortunately, there's dissipation in it. Once again, the Earth does the same process with, with water droplets, removing it from our atmosphere, and then it becomes uh, recycled into the plant material. And you know, everything is recycled; it comes back to something else later on. So, uh, what we're trying to do is for air purification: is don't put the stuff up there in the first place. This is part of the Clean Air Act, whereas we're reducing the amount of emissions. Uh, everybody keys on the carbon dioxide. That's actually plant food. We're looking at all the other pollutants that we want to take out of the atmosphere, the diesel smoke, the gasoline smoke, the, uh, the benzopyrenes or whatever else you've got in there that's you know, from manufacturing just being gassed off out of these tall stacks. We we're looking at putting on scrubbers and things to capture that before it's released into the atmosphere and explaining to the science, the companies that have these factories that they are actually uh, recapturing these chemicals and it's not a one-way street. It's actually a revenue stream that once you've recaptured them, they can go back to the, manu the processors that made those chemicals they were using before and you're not, you're not dumping them away. And it's not just a one-way trash system. And so it might be, you know, you're selling those raw materials for something else, capturing all your smokestacks. Uh, I think that yeah. uh, earth changes, yeah. It, it, we don't know when we melt glaciers and we melt uh, ice packs what's going to come up. Uh, there's a long discussion that we had uh, partly with, with the Oroville Dam and with uh, some of these other areas where we're changing the weight on the crust of the planet. Uh, think of it as, well, as one of my colleagues was talking about, he says, a trampoline with 10 very large people standing in the middle of it. Well, you get people to start leaving, and then all of a sudden, if they leave really quick, the little light guy goes, the, the lightest one in the middle just gets popped up in the air, or the trampoline comes back up. So when you raise and lower the water level in the dam, you're putting stresses not only on the dam, but also on the fault lines underneath it, and you're doing it rapidly, so you're setting up a vibration of compression, decompression. When you have um, areas where they're doing fracking, where they're actually putting more water into the ground and pushing the oil and the gas and the natural gas to the other side, you're increasing the pressure, and we're seeing these earthquakes happen in the areas where the fracking is going on. And this is causing stresses. Where we're uh, having wells in areas that are arid and we're draining the water out of the aquifers, the surface, the crust starts to cave in. And some places in California, it's as much as seven feet in these valleys that have dropped because they've removed what was keeping the crust up. So these are all changes in the crust. And our, what we live on as humans is not that thick. We're, we're kind of like on a, on a apple pie. We, we're we're the, the sprinkles on the top of the crust of the apple pie. We're not inside with the meat. So we're, we're on that top little surface. So anything that happens that affects the what's underneath affects what happens just on the surface. So it's, we're going to see some changes and uh, we may see things like if they melt Antarctica, who knows, we might see the 
uh, Atlantean pyramids come up and be accessible that, you know, they've been pushed down for many years. Uh, what goes comes up and so. Right. Next question. Thanks so much. Um, well, I think you basically answered it all in a way. Oh, uh, well, okay. Uh, there are two last two questions. It says, in what areas of Earth is it possible to manage the, uh, or uh, this, um, what do you call this, what we have been discussing, cleaning the atmosphere and all that? Is it from the mountains, the desert, Alaska, <laughs> ocean? <laughs> You have to realize that it, it, we're in a, in, a, in a biosphere called the planet Earth. It takes the entire Earth. You know, it's, it's all of those. It's the ocean, it's the mountains, it's the sky, it's the rain. And it's all part of this cycle and, and multiple cycles. So it isn't one area. Every area has a point and a function. Some areas are for oxygen manufacture. Some areas are for water purification. Other areas are to dry out and to condense it into smaller, more compact, like the Salt Lake, Great Salt Lakes. Uh, that's taking everything and, and getting rid of the water, but concentrating the minerals in one spot. So every area on the planet has a purpose. Yeah, and let me ask one last question. He says, what type of conditions are needed to be, uh, to allow it to happen, uh, uh, to allow it to happen, a clean process, he says, temperature-wise, attitude, attitude, altitude, <laughs> uh, type of frequency or scale of waves. Uh, That's the last We thing. as humans can modify the process, but we can't stop the process. We can uh, pollute, the, we can add more to the problem, but it takes the natural processes to undo them. And it goes everything from how do you reestablish salmon runs in rivers that don't have salmon to how do you clean up air and things like that. It's like let nature do what it does best, you know, and quit mucking with it. You know, you want to increase the salmon, don't kill off the hatchery fish that are coming back. They're going to multiply and the ones that have the genes that are best for that river are going to survive and they're going to go back out into the ocean and they'll come back to that river specifically. You, it let nature undo the mess that we made, but don't keep adding to the problem. Mm. That's where the beginning is. Don't add to the problem. Right. Thanks, Russ, for answering all those questions. Now over to James, because James was going to share with us very briefly about his new ideas of, um, well, he's got this website as well that I, I think I can uh, click on there first. James, you can tell me what to click and all that. Okay, I'll start sharing screen. Share Hi there. Screen. Yeah, James. Uh, okay, uh, James had put put a link there for those of you who want to find out more about the secret space programs. It's more complex than previously revealed, so he's got it there in his Super Soldier Talk website, supersoldiertalk.com. So that was the link he puts on chat, but because this is a recording, you can't record chat, so therefore I have to show you the link. So there it is. All right. So that's James Super Soldier Talk .com site. You can get all this information there, viewers. Thank you. So I'll stop sharing now. Do you want me to share another link, James, while you talk about very no, briefly? Fine. Yeah, okay. You I'll share just, it yourself. Just, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So um, let me figure out it is. Okay. Um, where did it go? Oh, gosh. Okay, so uh, uh, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the, the Sea Angel Hotel. Um, so this is part of, um, I, I recently set up this website called truesourcekey.org. And um, these are some of the, the projects that I want to work on um, to get funded. But the Sea Angel Hotel is a maternal ward type hospital for that uh, features uh, birth with dolphins and studies have shown that um, children born born um, in the presence of dolphins are, have 15 points higher IQ which is um, essentially one standard deviation 
And then um, they're also uh, less like they're, they're more stronger physically and less likely to have emotional issues. So we can market this to um, mothers who have either mental illness running in the family or mothers who want to have a leader, their child to be a leader or an athlete. Um, and of course, um, the program can also help people that have mental illness as well as, as well as PTSD. So the goal was to, um, what I like to do is um, if we can get a hold of some, maybe dragon family money or, or something like that, because um, we, we would need a substantial fund. It's the, the project's 3B, um, a 12,000. Thousand room hotel, uh, three different types of hotel: um, a nautilus shell, a pearl, and a clam shell. And we're going to build this in Hawaii. Uh, so I picked. I already picked a location here. Now maybe this is all could be subject to change. And there's already people living at this spot, so that's what makes things complicated because everything's so built up there. But um, we could always go to another island or another location, if need be. But um, so what will we visualize what I visualize we're gonna build a little uh, lagoon and we move up here so here's the, the lagoon and half of this will be for the dolphins and then um, the other half will be for the beach for the beach goers and three different um, large structures and we're gonna build what I like to do is build a tube out into the ocean where the dolphins could swim around in a, a clear plastic uh, acrylic tube uh, so that way the dolphins could swim into the water and then there'll be um, a Preferably uh, some kind of acrylic or, or some kind of partition where the dolphins can see out into the ocean too. But I'm concerned if, whether or not we actually have technology. That's so beautiful, James. That. James, are you um, going to get the famous architect Jack Fresco to <laughs> design this for you? <laughs> um, I, I well, if enough money thrown at us, I suppose so. But you know, he's really getting up there in age. I mean, what what is he? Ninety two or ninety six yeah, years old like now? 90, 90, I think now yeah. ninety two. Yeah. Uh, I hope, I hope, yeah, I hope the Galactic Federation hurries up and helps get funding going because he's not going to be around much longer. No, that's why we wanted to have those um, SSP technologies release mm -hmm. so we can put him yeah. in a regeneration and re-aging tank. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so basically I just have some of the, um, the financials here. And um, so it, it, the hotel does make money. Um, and I... I'm estimating, and this is, I know some people are going to might cringe a little bit when I tell them it's going to, the, the, the cost for two people staying six weeks at this hotel with one baby being, well, one birth being born um, is 30000 no, $31,000. Uh, so I know that's really high expense, but that also includes food in the hotel. Um, but um, the cost of an unassured birth in the United States is 30000 So, uh, um, instead of spending money at a hospital, if you don't have insurance, you could do this. So maybe maybe somehow we can get the insurance to pay for it. I don't know. That that's that's the problem. One of the problems in this country is insurance just skews everything or the health system. But um, we'll we'll obviously need to work on that one. But um, then we'll, then I wanted to add some other parts of the project, and this is where it kind of gets a little bit complex. But um, I thought perhaps we could build a Skytran, which is a um, it's this pod that, that levitates um, off the, uh, this um, track here. And this is a, a lot cheaper than a typical um, mass transit system where mass transit may cost uh, um, $100 million a mile. This only costs 10. And of course, Hawaii, because Hawaii is so expensive, it'd probably be 13. But um, still, 13 million a mile, and we've build up we need 43 miles or 44 miles we can bring it from one island one part of the island to the other and we can put solar panels on top of this so um beach goers can go because there is there is a beach right around here where this this project would probably be built unless it gets built someplace else um but essentially that's kind of what we're looking at and then what i wanted to do is if, if we could get enough funding and set this up properly is we could instead of uh spending $3 billion to build this hotel, we could borrow two and a half, I mean, sorry, uh, we'll use two and a half billion to create our own bank, fractionally lend out 10 times to create $25 billion of assets, of loans, and then we can, um, we can use that money to level this whole area, this whole community, um, reincorporate our own town, 
uh, of course everybody will get paid off. So it's not like, I mean, it's not like, um, we have to, everyone's going to get well compensated. And then what we could do is we could, um, create our own, uh, city owned bank as I, I mentioned about this in the last, um, time we talked, but, uh, I go a little bit more into this and I, I spent some more time doing the mathematics to make sure that it works because, um, if the bank, if we, if, if we could have our own city-owned bank that didn't use any interest rates, instead they only loan they loan money to businesses, and then what happens is um, the businesses will provide a dividend. About thirty-six percent of the income could be returned back as a dividend back to the bank, and if the bank owns maybe half the half the businesses, and really it's only maybe about fifteen percent of all all the money being generated. But you know, if you have seventeen, if you have a twenty-five billion dollar portfolio, and you know, seventeen percent of the um, the well, if if we have an eight percent ROI and on twenty-five billion, and then seventeen percent of that is what we're looking at. But um, but even that's kind of skewed because some of the money, the ROI doesn't consider uh, the, the amount of money you pay all the work salaries and workers. So, so really the, 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 the financials are a little bit complex and I don't really want to go and explain too much of it all. But what I can tell you is the mathematics show that, um, by doing this, we can make about $600 million a year and then we can, um, and that will include, um, housing. We could build housing for 24,000 people. Um, we could have $10 billion worth of, um, business assets as well as a $3 billion hotel and the SkyTran. And then what we could do is also set aside money to build a vertical to growing tower. So um, all food is produced in this community for free because um, we'll have an excess, which will be sold off and that will help pay for maintenance and operating costs. So we can have, so people can have free food. And then we can also have enough money that's coming in through this dividends to give everybody a right to thrive dividend. So everybody in this community will get $4,000 a year as well as um, $4,000 uh, credit to a health insurance fund per man, woman, and child. So we could give um, almost everybody free health care um, unless you're like really, really sick or something, then um, you might need to, you know, might cost a little bit. But uh, so, yeah, we'll have some levels of socialism and the businesses will benefit. Um, instead of paying taxes, they'll be enticed to invest their, their dividends into a, um, a bank account, which earns 21% annualized returns of APR. Um, so, and, and so what happens, and there'll still be enough money to pay back investors. So we're looking at paying back investors in three years for this project. and. Um, yeah, in 10 years, we'll have enough money to provide everybody free health care, free college and, and um, education. Um, so, yeah, it's certainly certain levels of socialism, but it's not really considered socialism. It's more like uh, a dividend, um, a privilege for doing a, a benefit for doing business in this area. So, yeah, um, you can go check that out. And um, I have a, the same project on a larger scale. I want to implement inside a biodome in Nevada. Um, that one is called Orem. And that one's a little bit more complex because we'll have its own currency and so on. And I don't want right. to go too James, we have to wrap you up now. You're supposed to do a one minute elevator pitch. <laughs> yeah, well, you're supposed to. You, no, it's a I know, but, but I told you I wanted to do this before we started. So we, we had two hours and no, it's just a going on and on about yeah. other things. <laughs> Okay. Right, James. Well done. That was a brilliant idea. And we just love the pictures, the visuals are superb. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. TrueSourceKey.org. Thank you very much. TrueSourceKey.org. Listeners, just logged in. Okay. And you see all that James has been explaining and presenting. <laughs> I'm, I was just kidding with you, James, but you've done, you've done, done well. I mean, you, you presented it so good. Right. So uh, I guess we have to wrap up now because the recording has gone on a bit and my laptop is heating up bad. Okay, because it's been on for so long. Right, so we got to go around the table, and Fred has spoken his, and James did, and um, I did, and Peter did. So that leaves Ron, because the rest of them has gone off. Uh, Daniel has gone off as well, hasn't he? 
but he couldn't speak anyway. I spoke on his behalf earlier. So Ron, is there anything you want to say to wrap this up before we adjourn the meeting? Yeah, that was, <clears throat> that was interesting on uh, on James' uh, presentation there. I uh, I had uh, I had a thought uh, something I just ran across recently. Uh, uh, there's a uh, a city in India that uh, uh, functions on three principles. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, they have uh, they have no there's no there's no uh, politicians, there's no uh, religious places of worship, and there's no money. Aurobindo or, or something like that? Yeah, it's yeah. been in existence since uh, 1966, I believe. Yeah. And it's got 2,500 residents, and they function, uh, they function on their own without, uh, without any help from anyone. That's so and good. basically uh, everything you, is, uh, is like, a, like a barter system. There's no banks. There's no need for banks because there's no money of any kind, none. Mm. And there's people there from uh, all over the world, different different nationalities that live in that city in India. Aurobindo, right? Yeah, I just I just ran across that in the last few days. I I, I saw a uh, I don't know if I've got it in my uh, I may have it. Uh, let's see, I would have to look in my recent. Bookmarks. Let's see. Recently bookmarked. Let's see if I've got it here. That might be a collective evolution. Let me see if that's it. Could be. Oh. No, that's a different. That's a different website. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think I think, I think people do know how to search that on Google. And anyway, anyway, it was an interesting concept to have. Uh, because uh, you know I'm not I'm not religiously oriented uh, myself, and uh, a lot of people aren't. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ron. Ron, and then we go to uh, thanks for adding that into the picture. Um, I guess you know it will come together all these concepts that are so much of the uh, fifty level, right? Okay, um, Peter, you got anything that you want to say so we can then. Uh, uh, wrap up this meeting and yes i would like to add only uh, to what ron said it's not for everyone you know there are certain people still who live in and they want their technologies as a number one priority in their own lives yes so if if we want to live in a coherent state of heart and mind with others yes then we need to mind that it will trigger getting rid of technology to some po at some point because it's impossible to have everything you know and the, the example of the city it's it's just not developed to the technology level so you need to be really happy with the lower level uh, of life rather than thinking that oh the new dome house you know in india since 1960 for instance this is the fully technology developed uh, city yes just to be aware of that yes that you know within time we will be able and we who want to join it we we just need to embrace it that we doing it not for only ourselves but we doing it especially for the land and for the environment and for future generations that's what i would like to add on mm, well said so with that, um, now that everyone has um, said their piece and <laughs> uh, there's nothing else that we could add to the table for this meeting, this meeting is now adjourned to the next one. And that will be, as I said, that will be on the uh, June 7th. 7th of June, the 7th of June, and hopefully Adrian Espinosa will be back with us, um, along with uh, probably Cynthia Bolter will be present for the meeting as well. And we're going to have a ball. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, James, for stepping in so, so um, uh, beautifully for Adrian and Cynthia. And Thras, thank you so much for answering Daniel's questions. So there you are, and Peter, thank you for 
joining us back now that you're back in Scotland in the UK. <laughs> yeah, it was nice to hear from Peter. That's the first time I've ever heard him. <laughs> right, thank you. There have been no other business. This meeting is now adjourned to the 36th meeting on the 7th of June. And thank you so much, my brothers. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Namaste. 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 Stop recording.